Sense of the Madness, I am Jason Burmis, and today we're going to be talking about defending the border and saving lives with the director and producer of the series, Chris Burgard, as well as Chris Paul in the latest of the possible Biden impeachment and beyond. Get ready to make sense of the madness after this. a little bit about a premiere you were at the uh, the pre premiere of an episode of defend the border it was called death county and the river of broken dreams we're going to play just a little bit of it so people know what we're talking about watch this this is a real brand under president biden has turned into a river of broken dreams we don't know if they are the the parents to these children or not right Usually they will use them because they think that they'll get an easier access into the country where at this point all you have to do is walk up. There's nothing made up about the border crisis. We're getting attacked every single day. Nobody understands that this happens several times a day. Uh, you know what? For a lot of people who are not caught up on the border and a lot of people who do know a lot, there's a lot of stuff in here that is very interesting. Yeah, we, you know, I wrote a book when I retired called Defend the Border and Save Lives. And this documentary is based on my experiences and, you know, 34 years and the tragedies that I've been involved with. We talked to this network several times about some of the criminal investigations that I ran, the tragedies where, you know, 17 migrants, you know, eight, 19 migrants suffocated death in tractor trailer, including a five-year-old little boy. I'm talking to girls as young as nine years old that's been raped multiple times by the criminal cartels. So I wrote the book trying to explain to American people, look, regardless of what your opinion is, it's on illegal immigration. When you cause a crisis this big, it's a record number of women and children been sex trafficked in this country under this administration. A record number of known suspected terrorists have been arrested and entered this country, this administration. A record amount of fentanyl has come to this country under this administration. More Americans are dead under fentanyl, historic record. More migrants have died on uh, entering this country, over 1,700, which is a record. So, you know, I, I want to explain to American people, it's just not about border security. It's about saving lives. If you defend the border and secure the border, you save lives. And the great thing about this documentary series that you've put together is it's absolutely free. All you got to do is go to defendtheborder.org, and then you can watch them. There are eight different episodes. Look at that, Tom. You're now a, a, a film pro producer, a documentary producer. A documentary guy that hasn't made a dime. I haven't made a dime on this. I won't make a dime on this. This is about educating the American right. people on the border. So when they get to the voting booth next year, they vote for the person who's going to secure that border. All right. Sir, thank you very much for joining us live. Looks great. Thanks for having me. And the truth of the matter is this crisis is as real as it gets. It is affecting not only the economy, not only the culture, but the individuals who are coming across that border who are being raped, trafficked, and beyond. The director of that film series is with us, Chris Burgard. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. And as I understand it, um, you had a start in the entertainment industry. You were Ferris Bueller's uh, body double on the dance floor, also a regular on Growing Pains. How does one go from that end of the Hollyweird spectrum and into documentary films? And why did you choose this as a subject matter? Um. Well, I guess it kind of chose me. I've, I've, I've been blessed by God to be in a bunch of different interesting situations. Back in 2005, I was working with some fellas on my ranch in California. Back then, we lived in California. And um, they were telling me about how the cartels had come into their village in Mexico and taken over. And if you didn't work for the cartels, you didn't work. And how it wasn't safe for their daughters to go around the village because they could... Uh, just be raped or kidnapped by the cartels. There's nothing you could do about it. So this is when the Minuteman movement was happening on the southern border. So I decided to go uh, check it out, make a movie about that. I came from the feature film world. I'd never made a documentary, but we took two crews down there um, and a bunch of cameras. And I was embedded with the Minutemen. I was embedded with uh, Border Patrol, Sheriff's Departments, uh, we also had ACLU and uh, Sin Fronteras, some leftist organizations. We covered all those. 
and the result of which was a movie called Border that we released in 2007, played for both houses of Congress and got me blacklisted in Hollywood. So that's how I got on this journey, making interesting movies about interesting places at interesting times. What a surprise that the entertainment industry would blacklist you for doing a documentary that exposes an uncomfortable truth. Let's go back to 2005 through 2007. What are the main differences that you're seeing on the border now as opposed to then? Two things. Um, back then when we were chasing bad guys through the desert, um, they were packing loads of dope. That was the main thing they were doing. They're making the money off drugs. Cartels are still making billions of dollars off of drugs. As you can see, fentanyl that uh, they got in that business with the help of China um, is killing more Americans in car accidents. Um, but the biggest difference is now they're not only doing that, but they're making more money trafficking humans, especially uh, women and children, mostly children. I was just down the river a few weeks ago, and every load that came over that we intercepted was kids. And uh, I've sat on the border with rape victims. Um, but to see these little kids, you know, four or five years old, knowing the, the person that has them is working for the cartels that they're not their parents. And it's, it's evident that they're not their parents. Um, and that there's nothing you can do to keep those kids from going into child trafficking. That's, that's a real tough one for me. I, 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 that's, I still have a hard time sleeping at night now because that's our new reality. And uh, back in 2005, the government was hiding their complicity with the cartels and the open border movement. Now, um, this administration is, you know, if you follow the facts and the data, they're basically partnered up with the drug cartels in helping them get record profits. Everything we're seeing on the border right now is by design. Um, you'll see when you see Death County and the River Broken Dreams, we've got some three-letter guys in there that were on the ground in 2015 in Central America, and they document how Joe Biden came there on a campaign, basically saying, give me your kids. And you'll see him on the front page of La Prensa paper down there. And uh, in the headline is, Refusios to Menores, will give refuge to the, to the children. And then in 2017, 2018, when those caravans started hitting the southern border under Trump, those were being financed and organized by our own State Department, working in conjunction with NGOs under George Soros. But that was our taxpayer dollars attacking our own southern border. And the result of that is now that Joe Biden has been in, uh, during his administration, we have over 365,000, 365,000, way more than a quarter of a million parentless children, unaccompanied minors in the United States of America. On top of that, we have another 86,000 that they've lost. And let me explain to you why, how this works. They quote unquote lost these 86,000 children. Before Trump, when we would, we would inter, interdict groups of kids, we'd, Border Patrol would take them, they would go to these federal centers, these detention centers. If somebody came in and said, hey, I'm Julio's dad, I'm here to pick up Julio, they'd be, okay, sign your name here, take Julio. Because the kids were coming over without any documentation and ID, we didn't know who they were. Trump stopped that. When Trump came in, he put in DNA biometric testing. If you say you're Julio's dad, you take a DNA test, and if you don't match that kid, you're not getting that kid. One of the first things they did under the Biden administration is stop doing those tests. So now we're back to, oh, hey, uh, Joe Blow from you know uh, Cincinnati says he's Julio's dad. Great. Here's Julio. Go, go have a good time. The result of this is the Biden administration is the largest child trafficking organization that uh, this country's ever seen. And we've had uh, whistleblower Tara Rodas who spoke in front of our uh, own government trying to reveal these very uncomfortable truths and she has been largely ignored. Obviously you had the uh, success, the surprise success of uh, Sound of Freedom which became more than a movie into a movement and that was demonized by the mainstream media have you seen an expansion of that demonization? And um, now we have censorship. Uh, we talk about, you know, freedom of speech versus freedom of reach. 
when you're trying to do a documentary <laughs> series on something like this, uh, how much suppression are you encountering? How much pushback are you encountering? Well, first of all, thank you for bringing up Ms. Rodas. It's by her standing up and saying that she's not only exceptionally brave, whistleblowers have become targets in this administration. They're not supported the way they should be. And we've been saying this stuff for a year now and people are like, yeah, 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 you're crazy conspiracy guys. I don't care about what you filmed. And then she stands up and they're like, oh my God, it's really happening. I'm like, yeah, it is really happening. Um, censorship, well, this Death County, the River of Broken Dreams was supposed to uh, premiere back in November of last year. And um, Fox News sat on it. They. Uh, they fact-checked it, which is great. That's what they should do. Then they hired an outside organization to investigate me and, and the producer of the show, and we passed that, and they still they still wouldn't put it out there. And because Tom is a contributor to Fox News, they've made it almost impossible to put it up anywhere else. Um, One American News wanted to, to show this. Um, there were other networks that wanted to show this. And um, instead, it's just on our little 501c3 website, um, because of Fox. Well, you can also find the first episode over at YouTube. We're not trying to promote big media here or big tech, but at the same time, it only has 7,000 views. The thing should have 700,000, 7 million, but we live in this post-truth world where not only are these things completely and totally suppressed, but like you said, they're constantly fact-checked and those that pretend to be on our sides do everything in their power to make sure it gets as little reach as possible. When you talk about Fox News, it could be no more apparent than what they did to Tucker Carlson, who was their number one draw in news across the board, folks. They didn't do that because of profit. They did that for narrative management. You talked about uh, Tom Homan. And Tom Homan also got his day in front of the Congressional Committee. I would say that he was treated rather poorly uh, from some of the government officials. You actually highlight that in the uh, first episode of the series. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that Tom Homan kicked their butts. I mean, I mean, Tom Homan is a star. He started out as a small town New York cop, put in decades of Border Patrol, then ICE, and uh, because he's just a straight ahead patriot, straight shooter, do what's best for the country, Trump made him the director of ICE. And um, man, I tell you what, when you work with somebody as closely as I worked with Tom, when you travel like we did up and down the border, not in great situations, you really get to know somebody. And I can't tell you enough about this fellow. He's, he's just, he's outstanding. And um, when you see this first episode and you see him kneeling down and saying a prayer before he begins to pick up the bones of uh, illegal aliens that that died in a in a cow pasture here in Texas, it's uh, it's it's pretty moving. Um, when when you see like in my home in my in my state of Texas here, you know my friend's ranch is seventy three, one hundred ten miles north of the border. People are dying on their property in numbers that that will blow your mind. My friend, Sheriff Benny Martinez, down in uh, Brooks County in Falfurious, Texas, he had to get a FEMA morgue to put in his, his parking lot at the Sheriff's Department, and it's constantly full. And most of it is full of, of people who died crossing through these pastures, but you know, some of these people are murder victims from the cartels. My friends are having to deal with coming out of the ranch houses and two, 300 feet from their front door, there's, there's female murder victims that have been raped and beaten to death. This shouldn't be happening in the United States of America, but it is. And, and, and let me tell you something. They, it's not just the networks that are suppressing this. On July 13th, we went to Congress. Um, we, Troy Nels hosted a, uh, Troy Nels, the congressman here out of Houston, hell of a guy, ex-sheriff, ex-military. And he had the cojones to hold a screening on Capitol Hill of Death County and the River of Broken Dreams. Out of 535 members of Congress, do you know how many came to that screening? And they were all personally invited, uh, emails, uh, invitations, follow-up phone calls. Uh, Troy's office did a great job inviting everybody. Out of 535 uh, members, do you know how many showed up for the, con for the, for the screening? If I were going to make a guess, I'd go under 20. Three. 
And and you know that you know that you know this is why you have to pay attention to what they don't do and don't say. You know there's a mantra out, an agenda to stay away from the facts. Because they knew the facts about the border, and if America knew that they knew how bad it was, they would demand that they fix it. So not only did they only three people show up, but usually on, on Capitol Hill, if you can't make a screening, if you're busy, you have a big staff. You send a member of your staff to go to go watch, to take notes, maybe film it for you, and to come back and to brief your boss, the congressman, and the senator. They didn't do that. That's that's telling me that that the same thing they did 20 years ago, they wanted to create the illusion of border security, or they wanted to create the illusion of, oh, we want to fix this problem. There's no interest in fixing this problem, not on the left or the right. And I'm telling you that as a guy who's screened now twice uh, for our federal government at the highest levels. Um, there's no, I believe it is. You know, they're, I, they're I believe just, it is America global. destroyed by design, and this is one of the big parts of it. We've got to take a break, but when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about the wall and how, you know, although the Trump administration was able to build parts of it, it was never able to come into fruition, and those parts now are actually being decimated under um, environmental policies where they are literally cutting holes in it so people can walk through once again. We'll be back after this. It's Making Sense of the Madness. DefendTheBorder.org is the website and the documentary film series. The director, Chris Burgard, joins us. Chris, I was talking about the border wall. Now, again, you're somebody who's been in the game well over 15 years, much closer to 20. What are your viewpoints on the wall? And what are the differences you saw within the Trump administration from the past and now into the present? Outstanding question. This is, this is let's use one ranch on the border as a metaphor for the entire country. I have some very good friends that own a ranch in uh, Arizona. And in 2005, I, I filmed uh, paramilitaries, all guys in military uniforms, carrying weapons, bringing over loads of what we suspect was heroin at the time. Um, it, was a, it was a very lucrative corridor for the Sinaloa cartel. Um, this ranch is a, is a stone's throw from, from where we filmed this in 2005. So this ranch, before Trump, was being overrun nightly with groups of 30 to 40 to sometimes up to 200 people uh, bringing dope through their property. This is a ranch where um, a Border Patrol agent had been ambushed and shot five times, left for dead. This is a very, very dangerous place. When Trump came in, they built, and there's, there's 10 miles of, of, of the ranch, 10 miles of, of border frontage on there. Trump came in, brought Fisher Industries in, and they began to build a fence. Well, when, when, and when they built this fence, the traffic started dying down. They built nine and three quarters miles of fence a, a, across this ranch. Traffic dropped down to zero, zero. And, I, and I'm telling you, that my friends are 80 years old, they're in their 80s. They were afraid to, to stand in front of open windows during the day for fear of getting shot. They didn't turn their lights on in the ranch house at night for fear of being shot. I mean, this is, this is in the United States of America. The town that they live in, uh, a third of the people have moved out. Uh, a third just keep their heads down. They're really scared. And by their recollection, about another third are the eyes and ears and work for the cartels in the United States of America. This is how bad this was. So Trump comes in. He builds the wall. It goes nine and three quarters miles across their ranch. Traffic drops down to zero. Within 48 hours of Joe Biden becoming president, they tell Fisher Industries to cease and desist, stop all construction, leave the tens of millions of dollars of material that they've already paid for, just leave it there to rust. Within 48 hours in that small gap between the mountain and the end of the fence, the paramilitary start crawling back through, just storming back through again. Loads of dope start coming back through it again. And this 80 year old couple has to go back to living in these warlike conditions. If that wasn't bad enough, when I went back down there again <clears throat> a few months later, they have these gates that are built into the uh, in, into the fence so that if Border Patrol needs to cross into Mexico, um, if there's a flood or something, they can open these gates up, but they're locked with these massive locks. They took the they they took the gates off, so there's now holes in that fence 
to make it easier for the cartels to get into America. And you can see, you go up here, you see the mountains, there's lookouts. You can see the cartel guys up there. They've got their little nest. They're on the radios. They're directing people traffic right through here. And the traffic is so intense that it's worn, it's worn paths down through the desert going through here just from foot traffic. But there's also places now where you can drive whole trucks through there. And when Trump was there, it was a fence. You couldn't do that. It's, um, it's insane. It's been done on purpose. And it's not only, people have to stop thinking this is an immigration issue. This is, and it, it goes even beyond national security to strategic thinking. Now, I may lose some of your audience here, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You have to look at this situation on the border as a battlefield in fifth generation warfare. Think asymmetrical warfare, think total war, okay? You soften up and you weaken up the country from inside. I've been doing this 18 years. Occasionally we'd, we'd run across, you know, military people or ex-military people coming across the border. Um, in 2006 and seven, my buddies in Hudspeth County, Texas actually faced off with Mexican military on our side of the river um, they were escorting loads of dope that the cartels were bringing in. But this last year, and this should concern every American out there, I've never seen the levels of foreign trained soldiers infiltrating across our border amongst these civilians as I've ever seen in the last in the last two decades. And you'll see in uh, you'll you'll see in in, in, in uh, this this first episode, we're talking to a a fella from uh, he's a soldier from. Um, uh, Honduras. And at first he didn't want to admit that he was a soldier. And I'm looking at him like, no, I, I saw the way you marched up here. I see the way you're standing. You've got freaking military training. What did you? And he's like, oh, okay, well, I used to be a combat engineer, but now I just want to be a chef. Okay. If that was just one person, fine. But within the same week, the same days, we're running to, to squads of guys coming up from Venezuela. And these are young kids. They're not as trained as good as this guy was, but like, yeah, see, no soy sodados. We're all soldiers. Um, you're running into soldiers coming in from, from Honduras, from Venezuela, from Guatemala, from Nicaragua. Nicaragua doesn't like us very much, and even from Cuba. Now, you see these guys coming across the border, and it's like, why? I mean, what, what's up? Why the sudden uptick in soldiers coming across the border? You know, I, and I hope the FBI is spending as much time tracking these foreign military personnel as they are J6ers, because this is a clear and present danger. Um, I don't know if you've ever had Michael Yan on your show. He is he is one of the best war border correspondents out there. He spent a whole ton of time in the Daring Gap. You know, go ask him about the Chinese Special Forces guys that he ran into that are coming up to the border. This is scary crap, folks. This is stuff we should be worried about. You know, in my brain, I can't prove any of this, but I, I hope that there's somebody with a higher pay grade with me that, you know, the next time a fuel center blows up, a refinery blows up, um, there's a train derailment with toxic chemicals in Ohio that's one of the biggest national environmental disasters we ever had. I hope there's somebody in some agency or the military somewhere checking and see if that has any connection with the uptick of foreign soldiers coming across our southern border. Well, speaking to what you said about the FBI, unfortunately, I don't think that they're more concerned with those coming across the border with military service than they are with J6ers. And that is also by design and another part of this fifth generation warfare that you're speaking of, you really honed in on a, a point that I think that we need to expand on. There really aren't as many Mexicans coming across the border as there are now other people from other nation states. You named a handful of them. Can you talk about that discrepancy and that difference from when you first uh, started covering this in 2005 to now? I would assume back then a lot more of the people coming over the border were indeed from Mexico. Yeah, so before in the old days when we were running into Middle Easterners and um, uh, people from Africa coming across the border, they tried to make us look crazy. Um, I staged in Hudspeth County, Texas, um, because they were bringing jihadis across. This is uh, under the Bush administration. And um, they tried to make us look like we were idiots. There's no way people from the Middle East would be coming across here. Well, no, they did. They threatened ranchers, and we staged to protect these ranchers. But the federal government has been lying to the American people for a long time now. And I'll give you one instance. 
Under the Obama administration, uh, we saw all of a sudden we were seeing Chinese coming through, being smuggled through these these uh, pastures here in Texas. And we were understanding they were paying sixty to $75,000 per person to get these people over. You'd go to talk to the Border Patrol, they weren't allowed to talk to you about anybody coming from China. They would just say, oh, we can only talk to you about the countries, the top five origin, China's not in it. So at the same time, the administration is saying, no, there's nobody coming through Texas, through China. You would have these big rescue stations out in the middle of these pastures, far from anything. And these rescue towers, um, you would press a button, get water, and it would send a call out to Border Patrol that you need help, and they would come and they would rescue, and they would rescue. Now, this is back in the Obama administration. The directions on these machines was in Spanish, English, and Mandarin. So the same time the Obama administration is saying, hey, there's no Chinese coming across the border through Texas, they're spending a whole bunch of money to put out rescue towers with instructions in Mandarin. Now, we're still seeing the Chinese come through here. That hasn't, that hasn't stopped. If anything, it's picked up. But interesting enough, under the Biden administration, one of the first things they did is they took down the, uh, ch- the instructions in Chinese. So there's plausible den- deniability, you know. Oh, there's no Chinese coming through here. You see, it's not even, the instructions aren't in Chinese anymore. Don't blame us. This is, they've been knowing this for years. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this is a worldwide multi-billion dollar industry. And um, people don't understand that, that, that Venezuela and Iran are, they work as the proxies for the Chinese military. And the people we talk to coming across from from. Venezuela, the ones that have been let out of prison, they're saying, look, we've got Chinese soldiers and Iranian soldiers, you know, staging these areas here in, in, back in Venezuela. Um, they are their proxies. Uh, and when they're coming across, they teach these guys from Spanish. I get a group of guys coming up. There's 12, 13 of them. If there's two um, Iranian operatives in there, I, I can't tell the difference. My Spanish isn't good enough to know, you know, who the real, real Mexicans are. Um, so, yeah, so we're seeing an uptick, you know, a lot from Central America. But again, that's by design. Joe Biden went there in 2015. He did a campaign. They went to soccer stadiums. They went to, you know, all these different public uh, areas and saying, give us your kids. They started this and it's, it's a funnel. They come up through the Darien Gap and you want to get here from Russia. You want to get here from Georgia. You want to get here from Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. It's a pipeline. And you have to ask yourself, how complicit is the federal government when they won't talk about this? Why isn't this in daily briefings to the American public? Oh, today we caught 13 um, Chinese special forces coming up from the Darien Gap. You know, every American should know that. You know, if somebody escapes from prison, they'll say, oh, be on the lookout for John Smith. He's armed and dangerous, but they won't tell you, hey, be on the lookout for seven Venezuelan soldiers between the age of 20 and 24 that just came across the border day before yesterday. Texans are on their own down here. And it's, 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 it's run so badly. You got Governor Abbott, he's done, he's done more than anybody else to try to secure the border. He's got Operation Lone Star. Well, just a couple of weeks ago on the border, a quarter and three and a half mile, just up river from where um, Lone Star headquarters are. And you've got Texas DPS, you've got uh, Texas National uh, Texas uh, Guard, you've got National Guard, you've got troopers from many other states. Just a quarter, half mile up, <laughs> I'm fighting and arguing with the cartel scouts about who they're bringing over, when they're bringing over. I'm like, I'm talking to them, hey, how's the water? Is it cold? And they're like, oh, F you, and giving me the finger. Um, I watched a 10-year-old kid come across the river and uh, couldn't get through the barbed wire, turned around, went back, and uh, started to drown. A cartel guy came in and saved him. Not an hour and a half later, they sent over a load of six kids and two women. And the women are swearing to me these are their kids. They weren't, they weren't their kids. They weren't even the same race. It's, it's, it's complete chaos down here. People are dying every day. And it, it's, it's a, the, uh, the average American can't understand how evil it is, okay? I complain because I'm tired of picking up dead bodies here in Texas. I've carried too many bodies off my friend's ranches. It shouldn't be happening in America. But let me share you a story of what true evil is. And stuff like this happens every day on the border because of the Biden administration's policies. 
Chris, Chris, before we get to that story, we've got to take a break. That's what we'll leave when we come back. We're with Chris Burgard of DefendTheBorder.org. Back after this with more. It's Making Sense of the Madness. We are back. It's Making Sense of the Madness. DefendTheBorder.org is the website and the documentary film series. We're joined by Chris Burgard. And before the break, you've really talked several times about how Biden sent out a clear invitation. You highlight this in the first episode of your series with many of these quote-unquote asylum seekers or migrants basically saying to the authorities, we've been invited here, give us our papers. And before the break, you were actually going to tell one of the stories of the reality of the crisis on the border. So you have the floor, Chris. Thank you, sir. And please stop me if I ramble. My wife tells me I do that a lot. So, oh, you're uh, good. No, you're great. You haven't rambled once. You're very concise, obviously. That's why you're a documentary filmmaker, my friend. Um, so, yeah, everyone you talk to, you say, why have you come here? And they say, well, Joe Biden invited me. Joe Biden invited me. And they come over the sense of entitlement, give me my new clothes, give me my money, and then put me on a, on a bus or a plane to where I want to go. So that's, that's, that's the reality of what's happening. But even though Joe Biden may be inviting them, they still are being brought up these plazas, these corridors by the cartels. And the cartels exact a price. So last summer, there was a couple up, I believe they were from Angola, they were from Africa, and they had a 15, 16 month old baby. Dad's carrying the baby on his shoulders. They go wading through the river. And um, currents can be kind of bad in the Rio Grande. And current got a hold of them. Mom started drowning. Dad did drown. Baby, they were able to get the baby and the mom out. They resuscitated the baby. They flew him. They life flighted him to the hospital where the baby died. Four physicians examined this, this, this 15, 16 month old child. And she had been anally and vaginally raped, they believe, between a dozen and 15 or 16 times. In the investigation, and, that, and that's, that's, that's what killed her. In the investigation um, into that group and when they came over, other members of that group said that that was part of the price that this family paid to get across the river into America was to let the cartels do this to their, their daughter. I've sat on the border with, with, with women who had been raped and they're so broken. Yeah, I'm a dad. I remember one girl, she could have been 14, she could have been 16, 17. And the cartel scout that raped her was a snot nosed kid about 15, 16 years old. And he just looked at me with the most evil eyes because this woman was so broken. She couldn't look up from the ground. She walked all bent over. She followed him like a beaten dog. She was in pain, she was humiliated, she was so ashamed. And, and he knew and I knew that there wasn't a darn thing that was gonna be done to him because everybody that witnessed those rapes in that, in that group, the cartels know where their family is, they know where their kids are. And if they said anything, they would kill their kids, kill their families. And I thought that was evil until I came across this, this what happened to this baby. And, I, and this again goes back to the government lying to the American people. I happen to know the coroner that did the examination on, on, this, on this child. That coroner has been put under a gag order from the higher ups, the highest levels of the government to shut up and talk, not allowed to talk about this case. Um, but the coroner's like, I can't talk about that case, but I can talk to you about the one on that table over there, that table over there, and that one up there, if you want more kids that have died you know, since Biden's been, under, been president. This is happening all the time. Now, why would a government not want America to know this is going on unless they were pursuing some other agenda? You have to understand this is all being done by design. And at least now the facts are out there. You know, you, you, when I say that the Biden administration is now the largest child trafficking, um, tra child, lar largest child trafficking operation that America has ever seen, just look at the numbers. Don't take my word for it. Just look at the data. That, that, that can't happen unless it's on purpose. My dad was a cop. My dad told me when I you know, trained me when I was a kid, he's like, you cannot have successful criminal organization without political cover. Well, and the cartels are making between 60, 70, 80 billion dollars a year. That can buy a lot of political cover. Um, there's a news network that I used to be on a lot when I was doing stuff on the border. And uh, 
off camera, one of the producers asked me and says, is there any way to stop this? How do you stop it? And I said, you can absolutely stop this. And like, how? I said, well, do forensic financial audits. You know, trace the money going from the cartels to Washington, D.C. And when you figure out who's on whose payroll, you, you can clear this whole thing up and the border gets secure. I wasn't on that network ever again. Um, but that's, that's the truth of stuff, you know. And it, it, it scares the crap out of me, the cart level of infiltration the cartels have in the United States of America. Um, I'm looking to see whether or not those with a higher pay grade than me fully investigate the Arizona governor's race, you know. Did the cartels finance uh, a U.S. government candidate who became the governor? Did they use uh, advanced real estate shell corps to shell game money to that person? I would like to see you know, that thoroughly investigated. And the results of those investigations should be out for the entire country. This is, it's not just gangs in our inner cities. This is, this is us turning into, we, we saw it happen in Colombia. Colombia became a failed narco state. Then, then we ha saw it happen in Mexico, become a failed narco state, cartels or anything. And now you're seeing it happening in the United States of America. It's plot or a plomo, silver or lead. You know, eighty billion dollars can buy a lot. And um, even if we secure the border today, we're going to have a whole other fight um, getting the cartels out of the United States of America. We got to take one more break. When we come back, I want to talk about your doc documentary series, where people can go watch it, how it's a 10 part series, and also how they can financially support you because I know these things are very difficult to put together. And especially when you have such pushback by the powers that shouldn't be. It's Making Sense of the Madness with the filmmaker Chris Burgard, and we'll be back after this. We are back with filmmaker Chris Burgard, and the website is defendtheborder.org. Now, this is a 10-part series. First things first, how can people support you? Because I know you're putting this out for free. Obviously, it's not getting distribution where you can really make your money back. We need more people like you telling the real and true stories independently. And then also, why did you break it up into 10 separate chapters? Well... The idea was to make uh, a series of, of 10 chapters because there's so much going on. You can't possibly tell it all in one movie. I've tried to do that before. But the reality is because of how we were tuckered before Tucker was tuckered, this may be the only episode we make. Um, our donors, they saw the first episode. They were thrilled. They didn't know. They were like, great, let's do more. Let's get it out there. But because we couldn't get it out there, the donors are like, we well, can make the best content in the world, but if America doesn't see it, we're not doing any good. So if people want to donate, they can go to defendtheborder.org. Um, that would be a big help. But um, censorship just doesn't come in the form of, of, of uh, you know, algorithms and keeping you off network TV. It also comes through... Uh, you know, attacking your Achilles heel. And our Achilles heel is, you know, we need donors to do this. We give the product away. And uh, that's where we are. And, and, and thank you for giving us a plug. That's, that's, that's really, really, really pretty swell of you. Well, I'll tell you right now, as an independent documentary filmmaker myself, I know how difficult the process can be. And then I can tell you right now, there has never been more of an environment where it is tougher to try to regain, not make any money, but regain the money and time that you have spent on these projects. However, again, it's essential because we need to show people that this is a real issue so that they can start looking in the mirror and not to others and saying, what can I do about this issue? What can I do about this problem? So my final question is, is there light at the end of the tunnel? We have seen a massive amount of awareness about this issue explode over the last five or so years. At the same time, um, we've seen an administration come in that has created policies that have made this easier than ever. So is there hope within the American people and the public to do anything about this issue right now? They're, they're a great question, and there absolutely is. You have to understand that knowledge is power. And right now, we are engaged in the greatest information war that the planet, certainly that our country, has ever seen. The fact that 
that the powers that be would go to so much, to such an effort to stop and, and, and keep Death County and the River Broken James from being seen by the American people that they don't want us to know this shows you just thoroughly how dangerous the truth is to their agenda. Um, but truth is funny because truth is never afraid of a lie and, and a truth has a way of coming out. It may, may take us a while, but there's cracks there. You know, people believe for years when AOC said, oh, Trump, you put kids in cages. Well, now they're beginning to understand the reality is Joe Biden puts kids in morgues. Joe Biden puts kids into sex trafficking where those, those children are raped 9, 10, 12 times a day until they're worn out and they die. That's the reality. And it's coming out, you know, Caviezel and Tim Ballard did a great job with Sound of Freedom, you know, that, that woke people up and that people are hungry for information. I have great faith in the American people. When the American people are shown the truth and you have to show them, you can't tell them, but when you show the people the truth, we come together and we do the right things. And if we, if we can't come together over saving children from the most unspeakable horrors and evils, well, then maybe we don't deserve to be saved. But I, th I think, I think, I think we, can, we can come together over that. Well, I think that it's an issue that should touch every single American, really every single human being on the planet. It is not a partisan issue. It is not a left or right issue. It is a right and wrong issue. And we have to hold those in government accountable that have enabled and continue to enable this tragedy, this uh, fifth generation warfare that you speak of, Chris. Thank you so much for joining us. It is Making Sense of the Madness. Back after this.